Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Humi Baba. I direct the Mahindra Humanities Center. And I'm delighted to see you this evening for a discussion on the history, the politics, and the perilous condition of human rights. I think after the election, we have a whole new raft of agendas and issues which I hope our audience will bring up and I'm sure our panelists will refer to. Now, it is a very unsexy thing to introduce one's wife. <laughs> One would rather be introducing a partner, as they say, but uh, Jackie is, Jackie Baba is the um, professor of the practice of health and human rights at the FXB, you can never remember exactly what that stands for, but the FXB uh, Center at uh, uh, the School of Public Health and works specifically on, or largely on children, children's rights, and uh, in a very um, bold move, uh, try to separate the notion of the best interest of the child always being connected to the mother or to the parents. So she did some analytic work in prying that apart. And I think that opened up a way of thinking about the rights of children uh, uh, internationally uh, and nationally. And I am um, delighted that she agreed to uh, chair and uh, introduce this panel. She is in much better voice than I am this evening and is certainly much better informed. So thank you very much, Jackie Baba. Hello uh, and good evening to all of you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here and very grateful to many of you for coming out. I think this is a, a, a very anxious time for all of us. I just um, heard on the radio coming over a short interview with a white supremacist saying how important it is going to be to get these ideas of white supremacy out and so for people to understand them and appreciate them. It's a sort of gut-wrenching moment you never think you're going to experience. Um, but um, I'm actually just going to make a few introductory comments about uh, the relationship between history and human rights. Um, and then I'm going to um, introduce our panelists one at a time in alphabetical order. So um, I think you can answer the question, what is the relationship between history and human rights in uh, various ways? One way, and some of our panelists are real experts on this, uh, centers on the history of human rights, a very rich field. So you can think again within that category of looking at the history of human rights of many strands. Think, for example, of the examination of the evolution of core human rights principles from the Enlightenment or the Euro-American revolutionary tradition, uh, that history that generated the holy trinity of liberty, uh, equality, fraternity. And think of the exploration of um, uh, the relationship of that history to the deep philosophical underpinnings of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, to looking at the genealogy of some of the foundational concepts like dignity, and non-discrimination, which are really the kind of working tools of, of human rights um, advocates. So that first round you might characterize as an intellectual history, a kind of archaeology, looking at the kind of roots of human rights doctrine today. A second strand within the history of human rights um, you could characterize as an account of normative change within concepts that are central to the human rights canon. I'm thinking here of the process uh, so vividly traced by Lynn Hunt, amongst others, uh, of the way in which torture was transformed from a routine, widely witnessed uh, public element uh, 
in the apparatus of criminal justice, how it was transformed from that to an abhorrent um, affront to human sentiment and a prohibited or proscribed activity, proscribed but of course still alive and kicking as has been often demonstrated. Uh, there was a famous report produced by um, Justice Antonio Cassese, Justice uh, uh, who worked at the European Court of Justice, who famously uh, did a report on torture in Europe and documented the fact that every single member state of the European Union utilized torture. So just to make that point. But anyway, this second strand you could characterize as a kind of um, an institutional history, a sort of sociology of the evolving nature of human rights practice. Um, a third strand in this uh, history of human rights is um, something that really consists of the documentation of the life journeys of key actors. So just think of biographies of Henri Dunant, of Raphael Lemkin, of Eleanor Roosevelt, Robert Cassin, Arya Naya, Jerry Labour. So people who are key actors, key players. So individuals who created new concepts to address violence, or who um, really thought of the threats uh, that certain institutional and political structures posed and really contributed to, to trying to intervene in some way. Um, and these biographies or these histories are also accounts of, uh, they also include accounts of not just individual actors, but as the work of, of one of our panelists, uh, Catherine Sicking, so, so um, notably has shown, accounts of popular movements too, so actors that aren't just individuals, but organizations, parties, um, civil society entities. Um, that, that actually contribute to really changing the, the institutional framework within which um, historical movements and human rights movements and human rights claims take place. So this is a kind of a historical biography approach, maybe looking at the, the agency and the, maybe the psychology, the psychodynamic kind of factors that contribute to agency in human rights. And then lastly, at least this is just this very kind of quick typology uh, of what kind of history of human rights might comprise, there's a kind of archival research that unpacks um, the diplomatic and doctrinal underpinning of treaties. And this is the bread and butter of human rights professors like myself. So you get your students to look at the travaux preparatoire to understand how we come to have particular phrases and particular concepts within the Universal Declaration or within the Convention of the Rights of the Child or whatever, rather than others. So of course, Johannes Morsink's um, anatomy of the genesis of the UDHR is an example of that. But they're comparable efforts in um, which, which really affect many other treaties. And uh, very rich um, analytic, linguistic interpretation uh, of, of, of the debates. But I think also what's so interesting about that approach is it really gives you a kind of very practical insight into the pragmatic construction of human rights doctrines. So it really communicates very clearly how these are not God-given tablets, but these are clearly artifacts of political and diplomatic negotiation. Um, and of course, all these strands still contribute, continue to contribute to the construction of a living history of, of human rights and to contestation over the place of human rights uh, within both historical movements and also cu current social change. And we're going to see, uh, I'm sure, much more of this contestation. Um, but briefly, um, I also want to talk about another approach uh, to the relationship between history and human rights, which really draws on the former history to inform the latter human rights. So here, the question really is, what can history teach us about current human rights challenges or imperatives? And many of us who are advocates and who are you know, not really so much uh, theoreticians or even scholars, but more really in the business of trying to advance social change, really, I think, prioritize maybe this approach. Really, what can we learn? And I think many of us are asking us this, ourselves this question now, and of course, people are making all sorts of analogies, you know, and maybe some will comment on this, how appropriate they are, you know, to, to fascism, to, to Nazism, so on, the current period. But so what can history teach us, and what can we derive from history? And I thought I'd just pull out briefly three examples, uh, which I think are instructive. 
So um, one kind of quite nuts and bolts use of this approach is to say, really, what can past human rights victories teach us that we can use today? And a very concrete example of that, uh, which is very relevant to the work that we do at the FXB Center, is the relationship between um, the Roma rights movement and uh, the civil rights movement in the US. So about 20 years ago, Roma activists in Eastern Europe approached leaders of the civil rights movement and really asked for advice. How did you manage, for example, to um, you know, get a victory like, like Brown versus Board of Education? How why might we be able to do that? We are struggling in Europe. We have a European Convention on Human Rights, and we still have widespread stigma and discrimination. So how could that history what can you teach us from the struggles that you've been through? Um, of course, very different circumstances, different political and legal context, but nevertheless an important set of questions. Conversely, from the opposite kind of angle, rather than looking at what past successes or victories can teach you, you can also look at a uh, history of past calamities uh, and see whether that's instructive in reducing present and future risk of massive harms. Or to put this differently, you could ask yourself, how can we translate the sentiment of nunca mas, uh, never again, into something more than a rhetorical plea? And I think we're very aware of the difficulties of doing that, having hurtled in a way from Bosnia to Somalia, to Rwanda, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria. We have you know, endless opportunities to draw on past calamities. Um, and the answer of how that could inform our current situation does actually seem more elusive than ever. I think, and I don't know if my fellow uh, panelists or other, other colleagues who I know are very expert in the room will agree with this, but I think in some ways R2P, the responsibility uh, to protect, is now somewhat out of fashion or it's kind of seriously questioned by many of us as being a an effective strategy, something that really was the product of this, of this kind of second strand, I think, of thinking. So we're left wondering what strategies there really are that we can draw from the past to address mass atrocity or to really build radical harm prevention uh, uh, interventions. And I think maybe now more than ever, we're kind of tying our hopes to the promise of information uh, kind of um, retrieval through big data, through technological fixes that can help us to really in real time analyze data and use, use that to really guide our interventions to avoid harm. Um, but thirdly, leaving to one side pervasive discrimination, genocide, or complex humanitarian disasters of the sort I just mentioned, how can historical knowledge and precedent inform current human rights strategies in maybe sort of more kind of mundane, um, everyday, constructive and positive ways. Um, and as Homi mentioned, I've, I've worked on children, but I've also worked quite a lot on issues of migration. And this question of what we can learn from the very long history, past history of migration, to inform our current toolkit and our strategies is a very real one. Um, because unlike genocide or civil war or racism, human mobility is constitutive of the human condition. And we've, we've been uh, in a long line of historical kind of trajectory of migration, of human mobility, since, since we've existed for over 200,000 years. And so there must be a lot that we can learn. And from that very long history, I'm going to just try in conclusion to distill, distill a couple of points which I think are relevant and helpful when we think about our current so-called refugee and migration crisis. So the first point I want to make is that um, the search for resources, where the resources of, um, on land and sea or where the other types of resources, uh, has always fueled human movement. Of course, the, the extent of the movement, uh, the type of movement has depended on the technology available. You know, if you have a mule, you can go further than if you're on foot. If you have sails, you can go further than if you're rowing, etc. But uh, this idea that, that you are moving to, in some way, um, search for resources is very, very, very inherent, I think, in the way our history has evolved. And of course, 
that's absolutely the case today. Resources, the type of resource has changed, but the search has not changed. And so we're looking for security, for peace, for a future for our children, for a way of earning a living or putting food on the table. Those are resources that are very unevenly distributed. And so, of course, mobility is a part of that. And now that there isn't any more empty space on the planet, you either engage in that search through cooperative means or through conquest. Um, but in either case, this, net, this sense that mobility is, is, is really inherent in our, in our condition and that flexibility is part of the way we negotiate the options we have, I think, is something we must take from, at least I'd like to suggest, it's something we should take from our very long past. So it's really only in very extreme situations like Syria that whole communities uproot. You know, we see in the Syrian context, you know, whole families with, you know, elderly parents in pushchair, in, in in wheelchairs, and little children on on people's backs. Everybody leaving, of course, to to save their lives. But more usually, and this again is the historical pattern, only some members of the family would forge this path, and then maybe come back or get others to join them. A kind of flexibility that um, you know used to be endemic. But of course now, um, since the late 19th century, early, early 20th century, we've interfered with that kind of sense of flexibility and free movement. We have increasingly rigid border controls, which affect everyone except for a limited elite. Um, and so the idea that population flows are an asset uh, rather than a burden is now completely obsolete. So I think we need to recapture that. Um, a second point I want to make is that increasingly, I think, recognizing the limitations of our current period, we can learn um, that some of the benefits and some of the rights that go with mobility and flexibility are being appropriated not by states, which are kind of confined by these national borders and exclusion regimes, but by sub-state actors. And I'm thinking of regions here particularly. So you think of the EU, think of Mercosur, ECOWAS, I mean, there are other now players that are maybe more powerful can, purveyors of rights in this domain than states are, uh, and that are maybe countering states. And you only have to think of, um, you know, what some cities have done in the US uh, to create identity and to overturn the denial of identity to populations to, to see how this, these new actors come into play. So I'm, what I'm referring to is ideas like the New York and ID system, for example, which we, we don't know, again, what the fate of that's going to be. It might just be a magnet for picking up undocumented people. I hope not. But certainly there has been this history of sub-state actors providing rights, uh, kind of referring back to that older history, in a way, of, of, of mobility and flexibility. So I think that's, a, that's another point. And then just um, my final point um, is that uh, if we are, and this again goes back to the long history, the long durée, as Carrie would say, uh, um, of, of migration, if um, safe and legal migration, which I think is the basic kind of core set of rights that we need to attach to human mobility, um, is not going to be possible without dramatic reduction in the maldistribution of resources. In other words, with, with the current situation where access to safety, security, opportunities for education, healthcare, et cetera, are so maldistributed, migration is unlikely to become safe, legal, and regular. And so we have to think very carefully about how we can draw in other human rights uh, regimes, other human rights mechanisms to uh, make this change possible. So the point here is that you can't really solve the migration problem just through migration. You have to think of much broader set of social and uh, political and economic uh, interventions to facilitate that. So those are just a couple of thoughts about how we can use history constructively to move forward. But really, I'm just the, whatever you call it, the opening band for a much more illustrious cast of players. So um, let me invite, actually, I think I'll invite all three of you to come and sit up here, if that's OK. Um, and uh, I will start by introducing our first um, speaker, who um, is uh, Professor 
Bernard Harcourt, um, the Isidore and Seville Sulzbacher Professor of Law, um, Professor of Political Science and Director of the Columbia Center for the Con Contemporary Critical Thought at Columbia University. Uh, Professor Harcourt um, works in the area of social and political theory, sociology of punishment, penal law, and procedure. He's a prolific uh, scholar and writer, and amongst his many publications are, um, I'm just going to read a couple of title recent publications, Exposed, Desire and Disobedience in the Digital Age, 2015, which was very widely reviewed. He also wrote The Illusion of Free Markets, Punishment and the Myth of National Order, 2011, and Occupy, Three Inquiries in Disobedience, 2013. Um, he is, um, and I'm not sure how he combines these two things, but he's also a professor, um, a, a director of studies at the um, Ecole des Institutes uh, en Sciences Sociales social in Paris. So he, he has a, gets a dual appointment and flits across the Atlantic. So uh, Bernard, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jackie. I've always believed adamantly that it's not the task of critique to set forth an alternative political landscape in the space that it's cleared out. I've always strenuously, strenuously resisted the idea that we critical thinkers should be compelled to offer solutions after exercising critique that we should have to propose a way forward, that we should have to solve the problems, not just identify them. That's precisely, of course, the reproach that is always and inevitably made to the genealogical method. Having denaturalized a concept by means of a genealogy, having cleared the ground of nominalist error, what is it that you propose we do? It's always asked. And I've never felt that it was my job to answer. I've always believed that it was a, always enough to clear the ground of a harmful illusion. But the illusion, of course, had to be sufficiently harmful that denaturalizing it alone was a task worth achieving. Now, it's not clear to me, it's not entirely clear to me that human rights as a discourse is such a harmful illusion though, that we could stop at the genealogy. Perhaps what I hadn't sufficiently understood was that my adamant opposition to offering alternatives may have depended on the particular choice of particular objects of critique. In any event, sadly, human rights discourse eclipsed a few years ago and is in retreat now especially in the wake of the presidential election last week. As we all know, the American people just elected as their next president a man who has repeatedly said that he would reinstate waterboarding, which of course is one of the three classic forms of torture administered during the Inquisition, and of course used by the Bush administration. I would bring back waterboarding and I'll bring back a hell of a lot worse than waterboarding, Trump has pledged. He's expressed his intention to fill Guantanamo Bay prison again, and for a while, he claimed that he'd torture the family members of suspected terrorists to get information from them if necessary. He's embraced torture not only because it, quote unquote, works, he says, but also because, quote, even if it doesn't work, they deserve it anyway. Now, one could say that this symbolizes the waning, if not the death, of human rights discourse uh, in America. And of course, what killed human rights, uh, really, wasn't Sam Moyne's 2010 book, The Last Utopia, <laughs> nor the controversy over his genealogy of human rights, nor his historiography. What killed it, in large part, is President Obama's pragmatism and liberal legalism, captured best perhaps by the 21-page legal memorandum from the Office of Legal Counsel justifying the targeted assassination of American citizens abroad and written by a dear friend of mine, former colleague, a crit, 
believe it or not, a former professor here at Harvard Law School, our own David Barron. So it's liberal legal pragmatism that effectively killed human rights, as well, of course, as a democratic tsunami of conservative voters. In other words, it's politics that killed human rights, not history or critique. So let's take a step back for a moment and look at the most recent history. On December 9th, 2014, you'll remember, Senator Dianne Feinstein made public a 547-page report by the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence documenting in detail the United States' widespread use of torture in the wake of 9-11. The report documented far more intensive use of torture than we had known. One of the detainees was waterboarded at least 183 times. At one point, within less than 24 hours, he, subjected, he was subjected to more than 65 applications of water. During the same time, uh, he was also subjected to other forms of torture, including a period of sleep deprivation, most of it in the standing position, which would have lasted for seven and a half days or approximately 180 hours. Another detainee was subject to enhanced interrogation techniques from August 4th to August 23rd, 2002, on a nearly 24 hour per day basis. During this time, he was waterboarded two to four times a day with multiple iterations of the watering cycle during each application. During one of these sessions, as you will recall, he became completely unresponsive. This is from the report, with bubbles rising through his mouth and remained unresponsive until medical intervention when he regained consciousness and expelled copious amounts of liquid. During the same time, the prisoner was also subjected in various combinations, quote, 24 hours a day, quote, for 17 straight days, to, quote, walling, attention, grass, slapping, facial hold, stress positions, cramped confinement, white noise, and sleep deprivation. When he was actually left alone uh, during this period, he was, quote, placed in a stress position, left on the waterboard with a cloth over his face, or locked in one of the two confinement boxes. Um, he spent 266 hours, that's 11 days and two hours, in the large coffin-sized confinement box. This is straight from the report. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, 29 hours in a small confinement box, the 29 hours in a box that was 21 inches, a depth of two and a half feet, and a height of two and a half feet. Of course, his interrogators told him, quote, that the only way he would leave the facility was in the coffin-shaped confinement box. Now, in the face of all this, as we know, uh, President Barack Obama decided to forgive rather than enforce. Uh, quote, I don't believe that anybody is above the law, he said a few weeks before his inauguration. On the other hand, I also have a belief that we need to look forward as opposed to looking backwards. My orientation is going to be to move forward. In 2009, Vermont Senator Patrick Leahy had proposed to convoke a truth commission to address the use of torture by the United States, but that was opposed by the White House. And as Dax David Axelrod said, we want to look forward and not backwards. Um, just a couple of days, Charlie Savage in the New York Times wrote a really fascinating piece about this, showing uh, and trying to explain uh, the implications in part of uh, the Obama administration's trying to focus on reconciliation with the Republicans rather than acrimony at the time. Um, and you'll no notice it was, it was a kind of, it was, the, it was the pragmatic voice of Jeffrey Stone at the University of Chicago that came out as the one that explained all of this away. In a sense, Trump could always do it anyway. There was no reason we needed to reconcile, we need, et cetera. We needed to be pragmatic. Um, and that impunity, of course, is precisely what opened the door for someone like Donald Trump to up the ante and what it allowed him, in some sense, to explicitly embrace waterboarding and even more brutal forms of interrogation. As he would say, you know we haven't been able to define waterboarding. They don't know if it's torture, which is something that one could possibly say as a result of all of this. So. It seems to me, I'm afraid to say, that historiography is not what killed off the human rights paradigm. Politics did. Um, and I, I hesitate to say this in, in present company, but I'm not sure that history as a discipline is so directly implicated in the current demise of human rights talk. 
To be honest, few people who have any role in the debacle surrounding the Bush administration's use of torture care much about our historiography, historiography debates over the origins of human rights discourse and the displacement of other ideologies. Uh, nor is it how we're necessarily going to be able to address the problem we face today in the wake of Trump's election. Um, uh, although, of course, we shouldn't ignore uh, the historiographic debates. What it tells us, though, I think is something different, um, something somewhat orthogonal, but what it tells us is something about critique. So to get there, let me return then to the somewhat acrimonious debate between uh, Sheila Benabib and Sam Moyne uh, over the publication of his book, The Last Utopia. This was in the 2013 uh, exchange. Now that controversy scratched at a scab, a historical political scab, that is significant in relation to the, to the present predicament that we find ourselves in, um, in the wake of this surprise election. Uh, and significant as, as well on the question of critique. I think it's important to begin by recognizing that Ben Abib's critique of uh, Sam Moyne's uh, book went too far, and I think failed to recognize the utopian friendly motivation for uh, Sam Moyne's book. So when Ben Abib closes her review by writing that Moyne's warnings are written not out of a sense of solidarity with but rather out of a tone of ironic and imperious detachment from global human rights activism, I do believe uh, that Ben Abib fails to appreciate the political project of the book. As I read it, the political project was to create an opening for alternative utopias, to prepare us, to inoculate us, perhaps, through historical knowledge for the coming collapse of a hegemonic moral and political vision. But although I don't agree with Ben Habib about these imputed motivations, this supposed detachment from human rights interests, it's undoubtedly true that the genealogical enterprise in which Sam Moyne was involved inevitably chips away at the naturalness of human rights and therefore inevitably weakens the force of human rights as a weapon. I'm acutely sensitive to this because I am in large part a genealogist and also someone who believes that discourses are weapons in a civil war that we find ourselves in, in the present. I will both engage in genealogies but sim simultaneously deploy human rights language in my own death penalty cases. But the fact is that the historicization of a concept is and inevitably serves to weaken the rhetorical, political, and practical effect and impact of that concept. This is, in fact, the, often the explicit objective of the genealogical enterprise, to demonstrate that a concept was invented or born, to identify the relations of power within which it emerges. In Moyne's case, the collapse of communism and socialist ideologies, and to trace its emergence in history uh, is a strategy of denaturalization that inevitably, by the very definition of denaturalization, undermines the power of the concept. In this sense, history is always deeply political and deeply theoretical, despite the protest of most historians, of course not Sam Moyne, but most academic historians. But just as Ben Abib may not have been entirely fair to Moyne, I think Moyne was not entirely fair to Ben Abib when he wrote, that Ben Abib considers it self-evident to classify anyone who questions human rights as amoral and anti-utopian actually vindicates the thesis of the book. Put differently, Ben Abib incarnates in where her philosophical career has taken her the very syndrome my book diagnoses with human rights as the only utopia she can imagine, so much so that she can only see others as realists who must have come to reject hope herself. So here, I think Moyne is not being fair to Ben Habib, given her Arendtian tendencies that represent a far broader utopianism than simply the human rights paradigm. Um, but of course, the important point in this controversy is not really whether human rights is her only uh, utopia, but instead, it's the question of recognizing that the genealogical method undermines strategically or politically the force of the concept analyzed. <clears throat> 
Now I take it we could respond, as genealogists, we could respond, well, what I'm doing is simply telling the historical truth. Um, but I take it that would rely on a, an epistemological foundation that many of us would renounce. So I think instead one needs to embrace the genealogical method, uh, which I think Sam Moyne does in his book. But then you have to be very careful about the implications of the method. And in this case, um, in this case, it raises the question of whether there is a role for speaking about the landscape that has been kind of voided through the history. In Moyne's book, um, Sam explicitly refuses to talk about future utopias or even to guarantee that there would be any. In fact, the reader is left at the end with this haunting possibility that there may not be another utopia to come. Quote, no one knows whether, if they are found wanting, another utopia can arise in the future, just as human rights once emerged on the ruins of their predecessors. Human rights were born as the last utopia, but one day another may appear. May? Not even sure that there will be another? Why suggest that? Or precisely, why do that? That is, critique human rights and then not offer even the probability of an alternative. Now, if everything is political strategy, which we probably agree on, then wouldn't it be better to not go after an allied concept? Or if so, to marshal new allies in the process? Why go after a possibly relatively useful illusion? And this raises the question, of course, what is the proper object of critique? I would argue <clears throat> that it may be somewhat reckless to hammer another nail in the coffin of our last utopia without engaging in the hard task of shaping a new one. The object of critique, I take it, should be something that we want to see eliminated or weakened. It's that that would justify critique without proposing an alternative. But if the object is an allied notion, then the question becomes whether you have more of an obligation to do something more than just critique. At that point, the question becomes whether you should propose a different way forward or the possibility of a different way forward. Sometimes the genealogical enterprise, of course, produces its own resolution. So I think that in the case of a genealogy of the free market, it produces a space that is inevitably and inextricably regulated. And in that case, the notion of the inevitable regulation of the space, I think, leads us towards something in the space that has been vacated. That's not always the case. And I don't think that's the case uh, in the context of human rights. So in the end, choosing properly the object of critique is really important and the duty to provide alternatives may ultimately depend on it. In conclusion though, and so as to be just a little bit more provocative, I'd suggest that the panel perhaps should be called politics and human rights, not history and human rights, and that that might address the more pressing issues that are less disciplinary and more on the table right now. I think history is possibly, but I hope to be corrected, marginal right now in the wake of the Trump triumph. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Bernard. Um, that uh, raises many interesting uh, possibilities for our, for our intra and intra-panel discussion and beyond. So thank you. Um, our second speaker is Sam Moyne, um, who is Jeremiah Smith, a junior professor of law and professor of history here at Harvard. Um, he, uh, as you know, has written several books on um, 
the relationship between history and human rights, uh, including the last utopia, which Bernard mentioned, um, which had an enormous, uh, enormous, was a tsunami impact on the, our field, I think. Um, his new book, based on uh, Mellon Distinguished Lectures at the University of Pennsylvania that he gave uh, in the fall of 2014, is, is Christian Human Rights and came out last year. And he is uh, a co-editor of the journal Humanity and has uh, engaged on many, many different um, 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 journals and, and boards. He serves on the editorial board of Constellations, Global Intellectual History, the Historical Journal, the Journal of the History of International Law, and uh, Modern Judaism. So, Sam, thank you for joining us. Okay, hi. Um, thanks to Homi and Jackie. Um, I suppose I should also thank Bernard. Um, so there's an old a philosopher, once he was famous, now forgotten, um, who offered the dictum that all history is contemporary history. Uh, and he meant, I think, that history changes uh, every day. We can only uh, read the past from the perspective of our present. And of course, uh, if that dictum is true, then uh, we have now to add a crucial proviso to it, which is sometimes the present changes bigly. Uh, now, uh, as Bernard has said, uh, I offered a, a reckless and much, uh, I think, attacked uh, negative um, genealogy of human rights in a sense at the wrong time, and I, I plead guilty to um, you know, all of, all of the allegations he offered. I, in, in retrospect, I think I was still responding, in a sense, to my memories of an experience of the 1990s uh, when it had uh, become a new present even then. And of course, things have changed once again. Uh, so I, I think I will just restate some uh, elements of the story for which I'm notorious. Um, in full knowledge and acknowledgement of the criticisms and defects it may have. And in a way, it's, the, it's lack of pertinence, uh, not just to uh, uh, the last decade, but to the last few weeks. Um, and then we can have a bit of a discussion and reckoning. So as I think he indicated, I do approach this as a di disciplinary historian. And when I took up the topic of trying to understand where human rights came from, I immediately um, felt that it was critical to define our terms properly. What is the history of human rights the history of? Uh, is it the history of justice in general, uh, the desire for it? Uh, is it a more specific but still basic history of a moral idea that individuals have non-negotiable value or dignity? Or is it the origins of something else, a list of specific entitlements, uh, each with its own fascinating trajectory that individuals might enjoy thanks to that high importance? Or else is it a political project, not a set of norms on philosophical paper? To secure those rights, is it for ourselves or for other people? Is it for our fellow citizens in a local community or is it for suffering humanity beyond borders? Is it alongside being a political project, a legal project to constrain sovereignty from the inside through techniques like constitutions uh, or social movements invoking constitutions? Or else is it a legal project attempting to constrain sovereign states from the outside through international law? Well, Depending on which definition one chooses, the story has to change radically. Some of those things are old, some, as I tried to show, very new. I think there was one way of thinking about the history left off of Jackie's list, which is the one I placed at the center of my own thinking at that time, um, which was, let's say, human rights as a spiritual orientation, not necessarily religious, but still about not just what ideas we cherish, but how we make sense of evil in the world and what 
what kinds of um, posture we think will help remediate that evil. And when I thought about human rights that way, I came up with an argument that there had been a vast change uh, in the history of human rights. Human rights began in association with the revolutionary idea, and then uh, in our time, since the 1970s, grew up in a different sense on the ruins of that revolutionary <laughs> idea. So let me explain what I mean. Uh, human rights go back very long in, on paper, but when they became a political project, human rights, as we know, everyone knows, were associated with the political project of revolution. It was for the sake of individuals, surely, but for the sake of the experience of collective and emancipation and empowerment um, of one another in a community of fellow citizens. So you could call that human rights 1.0. Uh, human rights are connected to state making, national emancipation, violence if push comes to shove. And in particular, they were about the erection of sovereignty, not its constraint, even internally, and certainly not externally. Uh, and if there was a project of constraint of sovereignty, it was for a long time internal. That led to, through some mysterious set of events, what you could call the update uh, or supplement or transformation, Human Rights 2.0. Human rights spread uh, in the 20th century in constitutions, but as we think of human rights, the concept feels different than the old sense it might have had as part of the revolutionary idea. The signature of human rights today uh, is not raising uh, 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 domestic concerns amongst fellow citizens. Instead, it's raising domestic concerns for international scrutiny, and if possible, international legal constraint, abetted by state policies towards other states, since it's a novelty that states have human rights foreign policies, and above all, a new sort of transnational mobilization for the sake of human rights violations abroad. And I've argued, as you've heard, that these last two features, state policy and transnational mobilization uh, for the sake of others' human rights become especially prominent in the 1970s. And uh, I'll show you a few Google engrams to suggest just how perfectly uh, that chronology coincides with the history of language. Uh, and that's in every language for which Google allows us to test salience. How much do people utter the words human rights in relation to their universe of discourse? Not a lot, uh, and then a little more in the 1940s, and then our wave in the 70s, which is repeated in French with Guadalum, and since Catherine may speak about Latin America in Spanish and in every other language that Google so far allows us to test. Uh, it's not a perfect claim by any means, but the argument was that human rights shifted in their connotations, no longer about state making, but about state constraint from above, national emancipation, no longer in a way fit with the idea of human rights, and most especially nationalism in the global south, since that's where uh, despotism was seen to arise in the global north. Uh, and a new, specifically nonviolent form of advocacy, uh, lighting candles, writing checks, publishing reports, filing lawsuits, got closely associated with the idea of human rights. The link of rights to revolution, ideologically and mobilizationally loosened if it didn't snap. Now, obviously there was a universal declaration of human rights in 1948, but I think as this chart and others indicate, it didn't have much effect. Uh, it didn't spawn a change in language, didn't spawn a change in social mobilization. It wasn't a response to the Holocaust, but a vision of nationally rooted social citizenship. 
as part of the construction of the welfare state of that lost era. However, it didn't decree an end to empire. Uh, and that, of course, required different kinds of ideologies and political movements, ones uh, that in the era of decolonization were more faithful to the revolutionary tradition of state making and, if necessary, violent self-emancipation. Uh, so uh, this, I think, was still too early to look for human rights. Instead, I thought it was important to look later. Uh, and a notable event in that regard is the association of human rights with the Holocaust, which had actually not occurred very significantly in the immediate aftermath of the destruction of the Jewish people. But instead, as Holocaust memory sparked a new idea, a new spiritual posture that uh, made human rights much less than they had been about the ideals of social citizenship and much more about the plight of history's victims. Uh, as part of this, I think we can notice some very interesting changes in the way we speak and think. Uh, in the face of decolonization, which for its observers in the global north gave the whole idea of revolutionary nationalism a bad name, uh, liberatory ambition seemed dangerous, violent, uh, and not worth the price. And it was replaced by fear of the predatory character of states uh, and the need for their limitations in view of human rights violations, which as you can see was not a phrase ever spoken before the 1970s, certainly not in the 1940s. So this semantically promiscuous idea of human rights uh, now became very recently about a baseline of protection in a terrifying world of power. It wasn't about the seizure of power to create the good life locally or globally. So I wanna spend my last few minutes on our present. Uh, I, I don't wanna deny a Bernard's claim that um, in a sense it's worth remembering um, uh, some aspects and as Jackie also indicated of human rights past in order to arm us now, but not also without recognizing their limits and, and in a sense trying to understand them for the sake of some supplementary utopias that we may need, especially in the current, uh, current circumstance. I think human rights have proven a crucial addition in their current sense to world affairs in their ability to selectively pl place stigma on some of the worst things states and more rarely non-state actors do. Uh, few remedies have ensued uh, unfortunately, we've learned that external pressure does little. More coercive options like military intervention makes things worse. And we may be condemned to wait around uh, for uh, indigenous forces to seize the conditions and change the conditions of their own citizenship, even though that can take an agonizingly long time. We've built a tool, but it's agonizingly weak, at best stigmatizing evil, rarely remitting it. But we also have to acknowledge that they have this other limit, which I think the election of Donald Trump makes especially graphic, which is how they bear on socioeconomic outcomes and especially uh, egalitarian outcomes. So the rise of human rights since the 70s coincided with the crisis of the socialization of citizenship through the welfare state that at least World War II had ushered in in some places. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, we can again turn to the history of language uh, to see that the rise of human rights has not come without loss. Uh, at least at the level of our vocabularies. Uh, at that time, when 
the chief desire for the survivors of World War II was to socialize citizenship as part of an egalitarian project. Distributive equality, not just status equality, mattered. Uh, socialism was alive and well, and it was even more popular in Spanish, as you can see, in Latin America, where I think it would be illegitimate to discuss its history and the history of the 1940s in particular, as if human rights were the main phenomenon of note in that era and not socialism, which we have lost. Now, these two phenomena do not necessarily connect to one another in some direct causal sense. I'm only suggesting that where our ancestors may once have uttered the word socialism, we utter the word human rights when we want a better world. Now, I want to make clear, I have never, you know, contrary to at least one implication you might have drawn from Bernard's talk, been an opponent of human rights, even in this international form I was focused on specifically. I just wanted to, if you like, put them in their place, find their uses as a tool, but not exaggerate those uses. Noting the limits of human rights in the socioeconomic domain could only count as a criticism of human rights uh, if it were a criticism of a hammer to say it's no good to turn a screw. Human rights have not been designed to face up to the challenge of distributive equality uh, or to solve inequality. There are economic and social rights that activists now belatedly, mainly since the end of the Cold War, have learned to pursue. Um, but those tend to set a low floor of protection against indigence, not a ceiling on distributive inequality. And of course, they say nothing about distribution globally. The poorest Americans didn't vote for Trump. And as impressive numbers as their wealthier betters, the dislocated and stagnated middle class that put him in office. I would suggest that means that we don't just need a human rights politics, but one focused on the whole distributive picture, not just the problem of indigence. We need a return to some aspects of prior utopias that put distributive equality at the focus of our hopes, not merely survival. So our current mantra uh, in the age of violation and victimhood, of human rights violations as the thing we think of, of the Holocaust having reshaped our understanding of human rights, has been, I think, uplifting the suggestion I think we all have in our minds is that human rights provide a bulwark against barbarism. And that's true. They can do that, or at least stigmatize barbarism. But I think we can also remember older mantras, and I'll just end with one, socialism or barbarism. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Sam, um, for another uh, fascinating contribution. And um, finally, we will turn to uh, my close uh, colleague and friend, um, Professor Catherine Sicking, who is the Ryan Family Professor of Human Rights Policy at the Kennedy School, and also the Carol Fossheimer Professor at the Radcliffe Institute. Um, Catherine works on international norms and institutions, transnational advocacy networks, and the impact of human rights law and policy. Uh, her publications are many, but they include recently the Justi Justice Cascade, How Human Rights Prosecutions Are Changing World Politics, and another book <coughs> excuse me, called Mixed Signals, U.S. Human Rights Policy in Latin America, Activists Beyond Borders. At 
um, and another book, sorry, very uh, well-known and widely read and taught book called Activists Beyond Borders, Advocacy, Advocacy Networks in International Politics. Like our other speakers, um, Catherine's involved on many uh, journals and boards um, and uh, is um, uh, a wide, widely uh, kind of noted contributor to, to many human rights discussions. So Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Jackie, for that introduction, and thank you, Homi, for the invitation. Um, you sent us some questions, but as you see, we're getting off topic, off the questions you sent us. Um, so I want to begin first by disagreeing with what Bernard said. Human rights is not dead, nor is President Obama's legal advisor capable of killing it, not, uh, not to mention Sam Moyne's book. Okay. Uh, and the conceit that President Obama's legal advisor or Sam Moyne's book could kill human rights, I think shows the narrowness of a genealogy that long has placed the United States in all too central a position uh, in relation to human rights. Um, so nor, and I'm saying this now with trepidation, do I think Donald Trump can kill human rights, but that depends, and that depends partly on us. And here I say us, I don't mean we here at Harvard, I mean people who care about human rights in this country and around the world. Um, because it, uh, this is a crucial moment for human rights, and it depends how people respond. Um, so, and in particular, I think we need to distance ourselves from the position that Bernard articulated at the beginning of his talk, though I think you gave us something different towards the end, and that is that we have the luxury of critique without ever proposing a response uh, or an alternative. And for you to, now, to say that here, now, at this moment, um, suggests the bankruptcy of the approach. Because if you can't even propose an alternative right now, how can you take the next step and actually engage in action? Let's say, defend the rights of the people who have been tortured or will be tortured, as you so eloquently showed us. Um, now, I understood that towards the end, Bernard, you were saying that, y that you think that um, you need to change your position vis-a-vis -vis human rights, but if I understood correctly, the best you can say is perhaps you shouldn't choose human rights as an object of your critique because it's an allied concept. And I don't think that's good enough. Um, so what we need now is exactly politics. Politics, not in the kind of derogatory way that Bernard referred to it as the politics, the dirty stuff that is killing human rights, okay? But politics in the best Arendtian sense of politics, what people do in the public sphere together to try to refashion our world. Um, now, as you can see, I'm totally off topic, so I'm gonna just move way past everything I was gonna say. Um, and I'm gonna start with the issue of the genealogy, because we've been offered a genealogy. It's a genealogy I disagree with. Um, I'm gonna, it's in, dis, I would put both Bernard and Sam in the, you know, together with uh, David Kennedy in what I call the tainted origins genealogy of human rights. More recently, it's been articulated by uh, Stephen Hopgood, uh, who writes, it is only as a byproduct of American power and money that human rights have been globalized, okay? Um, and I would like to offer an alternative genealogy that has to do with the forgotten or erased history of protagonism and activism from the global south. And in this case, I wanna disagree with Sam, I think, and Google engrams are not a substitute for archival and detailed historical research. They give us some hints about interesting things that are happening in the world of print, but um, 
there is excellent historiography that's going on. People who are writing the, uh, a history of human rights with a much greater perspective from the global south. If I can just recommend one book, a very recent one, Stephen Jensen's The Make of National Human Rights, the 1960s, Decolonization and the Reconstruction of Global Values. About what happened in the 60s, what happened in the 70s, who was taking the action, and why it wasn't a desert with regard to human rights the way Sam suggests. So um, I don't have time to go through all my slides, but what I, uh, my own research has focused on Latin American um, uh, protagonism in human rights. Um, I um, completely agree that we talk about international human rights here, Sam, with, with this I completely agree. You need to think about who were the first people who articulated the notion that you needed to have an international protection of human rights. There's some dispute, but apparently I believe that the first person was a, a Chilean jurist, Alejandro Alvarez, in 1916. Um, uh, we have, is Liliana Obregón here? We have, an, uh, anyway, Scott. Yeah, Liliana, who is an expert on Latin American history and has written wonderful work on uh, a number of Latin American uh, legal theorists who've made major contributions. Um, uh, uh, so I'm gonna give, show you a lot of faces and a lot of names that people will not recognize. You will not recognize their faces, you will not know their names. I'm gonna claim that they are every bit as important to the history of human rights as the names we all know and hear. And be it be uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, Jimmy Carter, um, uh, the names, some of the names that uh, Jackie named at the beginning. Um, and I'm gonna say that not that, that, that these, we don't know their names because mainly as scholars living here and working here in the global north, sometimes we haven't bothered to go out and do the history and do the interviews and check the archives at, to be able to tell this history. So uh, I'm gonna run through really quickly some faces and names. Berta Lutz, the Brazilian journalist who made sure in San Francisco in 1945 that uh, women's rights were really gonna be included in the UN Charter. And she, there were only six women president, present in San, the San Francisco meeting that drafted the UN Charter. Uh, three are from Latin America. The Latin American women worked hard to make sure language got in the Charter on behalf of women's rights, and they were opposed by the women delegates from the United States and from the United Kingdom, um, who thought they didn't need that special attention to women because they had already achieved enough. Um, here, then this goes to, um, to Jackie's point about the importance of tracing some of those, I think this was your fourth type of history, some of those documents. I spent a lot of time looking at the first intergovernmental de declaration of human rights. It is not the Universal Declaration, as we all think. It's the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man. It was passed in April 1948, eight months before the Universal Declaration. It had all the rights that would later go into the Universal Declaration, and the entire draft was in place before the first meeting of the group that would launch the Universal Declaration, that would write the Universal Declaration. And yet, no one, I promise you, people don't know this, including many people in Latin America. We've erased, essentially, this Latin American contribution to human rights. Um, now, some people, I think this is kind of Sam's point is, this doesn't matter, there's a lot of words, declarations, it's not real movements. But, what I have found through my history is that the real movements of oppressed people, when the dictatorships began to hit Latin America and elsewhere in the world, turned to these declarations, to these laws, to these institutions as vital resources to give them ideas, to give them a place to turn when they were desperate, and there is a direct link between the law and the institutions that were set up in the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s, and the activism that came later in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. And so this is a false distinction that we only want to look at the engram when the words go up instead of looking at the hard work that, that people all around the world of building human rights law and building human rights movement that later was a critical resource for activists around the world. Um, so just, you know, we're at, uh, 
Sam's interested in economic social rights. The reason economic social rights are in the Universal Declaration is not primarily as mainly assumed because of the Soviet Union. It's because of this individual, Hernan Santa Cruz, a Chilean diplomat. He was one of the five people who, the internal drafting group of the Universal Declaration, and he brought with him a Latin American social democratic perception. We're talking 19... 48, right, a social democratic that saw the equal importance of political and civil rights and economic, social, and cultural rights, and that did not want to divide those uh, 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 in an arbitrary manner, okay? So at the essence of the Universal Declaration and a tool for people today is this indivisibility of economic rights and political rights. Uh, so necessary one for the other. Um, the activists did not only come, the, excuse me, in this case, these, are act, these were diplomats who were also activists and visionaries. Okay, so they happened to work for states, but they had a really important role in constructing the human rights regime. They did not only come from Latin America, this is Madame Pandit, the president of the UN General Assembly, uh, the first woman president of the General Assembly in the 50s, but she, as a, as a representative from Nehru's India, was the first person who ever proposed and carried a, a human rights um, debate in the UN General Assembly. It's before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, working only on the charter and it was about the rights of, of Indians in South Africa. The South Africans claimed that this was an issue of sovereignty, that the UN Charter said that you can't interfere in the sovereign issues of a country, and Madame Pandit made a very clear point in the General Assembly that the, the rights of Indians in South Africa was not an, a matter of internal sovereignty, that human rights issues were international issues and a matter of concern of all. The, uh, another Indian, uh, Hamza Mehta, was the person who made sure that it was a universal declaration of human rights and not the rights of man. You see the American Declaration at the same time as the American Declaration of Rights and Duties of Man. But Hamza Mehta, was, uh, the delegate from India, said, we can't put the rights of man, because if we do, there are many people in the world who will think only men have rights. And, and she fought for it and secured that it was a human rights declaration. The first major campaign, the first major global human rights campaign with the support of many resolutions in the, uh, um, in the General Assembly was the anti-apartheid campaign. And human rights ideas are already present in the declaration of the ANC Youth League in 1945. And they see human rights as one tool for liberation, for a liberation struggle. Um, the, uh, the story of, that, that I don't have the slides, but the story that Stephen Jensen tells in this book is contrary to the argument that Sam has made in his book, decolonization was about both sovereignty and human rights, not, not either, not only sovereignty, not human rights, but many, many uh, African leaders and uh, movements, decolonization movements, wanted sovereignty in part because they believed that only with sovereignty could they protect rights. So uh, uh, it was a, a demand for rights and sovereignty. Now, there were, some, of course, uh, uh, there was more attention, sometimes only to South Africa and not to rights violations that were happening within newly uh, uh, decolonized states. But um, in some examples, uh, Julius Nereri here uh, was extremely outspoken, saying we had to look at practices within our states as well as a, uh, a denounce apartheid, and in fact was very outspoken against the human rights violations of the Idi Amin regime. And then this is my favorite news story I just learned from the Jensen book, is actually the incredible activism of Jamaica. Uh, 
around human rights. And in fact, Jensen claims, and I'm not prepared to believe him, that the first human rights foreign policy, bilateral foreign policy, was not Jimmy Carter in 1976, it was actually Jamaica prior to that. Jamaica, the Jamaicans, only two months after they had gained uh, 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 independent status gave uh, 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 vibrant speeches in the United Nations where they um, called for a human rights year and in particular promoted along with the other African Asian states, this is another uh, important Jamaican representative, the first human rights treaty with enforcement provisions, which was the convention for the elimination of all forms of discrimination. Okay, this was a huge uh, demand of the newly decolonized countries, mainly Afro-Asian group, but joined by people like, uh, by countries like Jamaica. It was drafted very rapidly, 62 to 65. This is a time when the, the, the human rights covenants have, are, are totally uh, uh, backed up. They're totally not moving ahead. The African-Asian group comes, they, they demand this treaty, they draft it very quickly, they get unanimous ratification of it in the General Assembly. It enters into force in 1969. And because these people feel so strongly about racial discrimination, they, in, they give it the first enforcement provisions, the first treaty with the treaty body. I didn't, this was new, new to me, Jackie, and maybe interesting. And the first human rights treaty with the right to individual petition. Once those got into the convention on the rights, uh, the third convention, they then were placed in all subsequent human rights treaties. So the, the, the innovation in treaty writing came from the Global South in the third treaty and then was transferred on to other treaties. So I think my time is up, um, but I just want to end with this notion that in these times, we, um, we need to do much more than just not critique human rights. We need to develop a politics uh, a resistance, it will be a uh, human rights politics. We'll need to draw on, as Jackie said, everything we know about victories and failures in order to fashion it. Um, and uh, in this situation, what, with all of the many frailties and failures of human rights in the past, they continue to be the best ideas and tools that we have to face the struggle ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Catherine. Uh, so I think I, I didn't um, cut off our, our speakers because uh, um, I think they, they all went a little bit beyond their allotted time. So what I think I'll do is just invite each of you to ask one question to each other, <coughs> excuse me, if you'd like to, or to raise a, you know, a rebuttal um, of points made, and then we'll open it up to our, our, our colleagues in the audience. So, Bernard, would you like to um, sure. uh, maybe take on some of the points that uh, either Sam or Catherine made? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Thank you. Yeah, and sure. Thank you for both of your interventions. Um, so um, I'll, I'll plead guilty to one thing, which is parochialism. Um, I'm now predominantly focused on d representing people on death row in the United States. So I don't deal really that much with uh, human rights in other parts of the world. Um, I did previously work in South Africa and in Guatemala, but right now I'm just uh, doing Alabama cases. So, so it is somewhat provincial, that's for sure. I, I, I'll try and explain what I meant by um, human rights either being dead or in retreat. And it's simply that in my parochial domain, um, the use of human rights as a weapon uh, is not particularly working right now. Um, it looked a lot more promising for advocates in the 1990s uh, and in the 2000s, and you can see that everywhere. Um, when I originally started working in the death penalty area, I, uh, I worked first at a place called the Southern Prisoners Defense Committee uh, in Atlanta. And they changed their name from the Southern Prisoners Defense Committee uh, 
to the Southern Center for Human Rights. Um, there was, that was a, a movement, and there was movement there. There was a lot of funding. Um, foundations are moving away from the human rights area, at least in my, in my provincial uh, backyard. Uh, courts uh, haven't been buying it, and obviously the politicians uh, aren't doing a very strong job there. I personally have no sentimental attachment to any of the weapons I use. I have no sentimental attachment to human rights discourse as a weapon. Um, if I can keep the state of Alabama from injecting Dole Ham with, right now, a single dose of drugs, I'll be happy. And I'll use any language and any weapon and any vehicle to do that. So um, for a while, I tried human rights. Uh, we, 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 we thought there was going to be a little bit of room with the um, death row phenomenon, which is the soaring decision uh, from the European court, which would have allowed, well, which bars uh, Death, being on death row for more than five years, but that hasn't gotten us anywhere. Um, we tried other forms of use of international human rights. Uh, that didn't get us anywhere. Right now, mostly, mm, I rely on uh, Eighth Amendment complicated questions about the jury's right to find facts, um, Hearst, the Hearst decision out of Florida, and things like that. Mm -hmm. But frankly, I mean, my point is that I have no sentimental attachment to any of these discourses and any of these histories. And to me, they're just all instruments. So that's what I mean. And when I say that it's in retreat, I mean it's not a very effective instrument for me right now in my litigation. Uh, so uh, this was wonderful, and, and, and the fact is that even though they both disagree with me, I, I basically agree with everything <laughs> that both of these panelists said. So I'm trying to figure out why, why they dis think they disagree with me. Um, it was good news to hear that I didn't single-handedly kill human rights, um, especially since I never set out to do so. Um, I merely wanted to understand their agonizing limits uh, and the topics they simply do not address, maybe never will. Uh, it's true that I don't go in for stories that romanticize diplomats and the laws they make in international settings without asking whether any of that mattered. Um, so it could be true, for example, that the NAACP had a role in served the treaty that Catherine mentioned, but then we have to ask, has it proven useful to Black Lives Matter? Uh, we could ask, uh, to what degree, if it's true that a social democrat from Latin America came to an international forum after being appointed by a state to do so, how, to what degree did socialists in Latin America before their projects were destroyed think internationalizing human rights was important. How many? More than one? More than 10? Uh, and that's the purpose of the engrams, which is just to stimulate questions about what people have cared about, uh, the plurality of things they've cared about. But mainly, I, I said very clearly that I think human rights are valuable. They're valuable for what they're good for, not everything and anything. And in particular, I would posit just again to Catherine that if we think that populism is a difficulty that in our new present we should face a forthrightly, I can't understand how international human rights uh, are up to the challenge of facing it, especially to the extent we diagnose populism as, as a, um, a, a symptom of, of distributive inequality. Um, and so that doesn't mean that human rights are dead or should be killed, God forbid. It means that we need other tools in addition uh, and have to not just tell history to celebrate uh, heroes that, for whom we search, but mm -hmm. find the limits to the political projects they failed to erect mm -hmm. or saw destroyed for that matter. So 
So I heard Bernard say that Obama's legal advisor can kill human rights, and I just heard Sam say about what diplomats have done, did all over the, the uh, world, and especially in the Global South in the, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, was not very important. And I, I think that, that I've worked a long time in human rights activists. I believe activism is very important, but I don't think we should ignore at all what happens in governments, as we're seeing all too, in you know, all too frightening a way right now? Governments can uh, make a huge difference for human rights struggles, and they did it in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, and I don't think we should ignore what they did. So now, so Bernard, what I heard you say now was saying, we can only be critical, I can't propose anything, but I do lots of things to help human rights. So what I want to know is the, the intellectual position saying you can do things, but that you can never say, how do you choose what you do if you can't propose anything? How do you choose to, to work on a particular issue and not another? And, and does the work that you're doing on de with death row, does that not allow you to say a single thing to a public, a student, to students about what to propose something? Should I answer? Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's see. Um, I, I want to. I think we we should address a couple of issues here. Uh, one of them is this question of Obama and Obama's advisors, which I think keeps on coming up. And um, uh, I think. Um, Thank you. I I I, I do actually think that the decisions to kind of paper over to kind of create legal justifications um, for target assassinations abroad, that whole kind of approach of legally justifying those actions, which is, I think, characteristic of the Obama administration, I, I think that that does a lot of damage to uh, notions of human rights that, that you're interested in. Um, and I really do think that the fact that there was a complete spineless kind of folding over on forms of torture that were pretty horrendous has really emptied the political space of much uh, strength for any kind of claims of human rights. I mean, I, 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 so I, I, I do think that that kind of form of liberal legal pragmatism that was so in evidence over the last eight years has been really extremely detrimental to anyone talking about human rights. So that's one thing that I, I really want to maintain. Now, um, you know, uh, how do I decide to work on death penalty cases? I'm, I'm I, I, I don't know, I, you know, those, that's, a, that's a very complicated question about being motivated by uh, particular things. I, I, I work on death penalty cases. I, I, I try to do a lot on police shootings. Um, I'm very implicated in mass incarceration, in issues of punishment and so justice. So how can you not propose anything? Um, so, so I don't know if I don't propose anything. I, I actually, I think I motivate and inspire um, my students uh, who work on death penalty cases with me. Um, who go into the field uh, to become uh, uh, lawyers or critical thinkers. Um, uh, but I, I am very open about the fact that what has been most useful in my representation of uh, Dole Ham, for instance, since 1990, um, has been... Uh, Procedural, proceduralism, proceduralism. It, ha it hasn't been human rights. So maybe I can just jump in and say I, I think uh, uh, you know we have clearly some some fundamental disagreements in the way 
I think our panelists are framing the issue. It seems to me that, Bernard, when you say you have no sentimental attachment to any particular, you know, category of, of, of movement or rights, um, I think uh, you're, you're really talking about kind of just instrumental uh, uses of techniques in individual litigation, which is very different from what I think Catherine's talking about, which is concepts which mobilize movements. So, you know, human rights is is something which might, maybe could mobilize uh, people to, to demonstrate, to demand, uh, you know, justice or reversal of social inequality in a way in which... Um, you know, more technical, narrow uh, arguments about the Eighth Amendment or about, you know, the Serene case and ECHR are, are not going to deliver. So I think you're talking at, at, at different levels. Clearly, what works in individual litigation is going to be quite different from what works in, a, in an advocacy movement. I, I'm not sure if I'm missing something, but my sense is that there's slightly uh, cross purposes. And similarly, I wonder whether, Sam, you, you I think, in your book as well, and in, 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 in your comments, you, you draw a, a quite a dichotomous distinction between human rights and socialism, which I think maybe Catherine I mean, I'm speaking for you, Catherine, but you might not accept. I mean, there may well be a way in which uh, there are fundamental areas of overlap between the two, and there are traditions within human rights which are perfectly compatible and see themselves as compatible with socialism. But I think maybe you would disagree with that. So I don't know whether the two of you could just maybe briefly comment on, on these two observations, and then we'll open up to the floor. And Catherine, you could also jump in if there's anything you want to say. But so have I misunderstood that you're really not talking about concepts that mobilize big social movements to press for social change, Bernard, but that you're talking about the toolkit that you think is valuable. And in that sense, you don't have any sentimental attachment to any more overarching ideology. Did I get you right? No, I don't think so. OK. No. Um, I am motivated by an internal sense of justice that is offended by the idea of waterboarding somebody for 183 times uh, or uh, extinguishing someone's life. Um, and I think that I sh can share and impart that feeling and that sentiment, and those sentiments, um, through stories, um, in part that humanize uh, my clients, um, and that make others feel as if there are injustices that need to be addressed. The people and the many students and the many colleagues who've gone down to Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Texas, et cetera, to do death penalty work, for instance, are motivated out of that sense of injustice, about seeing those cases, about seeing the fact that someone was represented by an attorney who put in eight hours of investigation before the capital trial, right? Um, now, you know, I think that's what motivates people. I think that a lot of um, social movements today, the Black Lives Matter movement, I think the anti-police uh, shooting movement is motivated by senses of injustice uh, by images and by shared narratives of seeing individuals being gunned down, or African American men predominantly being gunned down for no reason at all. For okay, right. yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, Tom. So I actually think there's a deep um, tension between these two. It's a classic liberal Foucauldian tension. I'm not really, you know, in that fight exactly, but it's, we shouldn't pretend that it's not real. Um, I, my objection to human rights or worry about them is that it is, is about how, um, you know, they're really just a subset of the available normative ideals and above all mobilizational practices that we can imagine. And, and the socialism example, I think, raises that. So, you know, even if you just look at the Universal Declaration or any successor document on paper, um, distributive equality is not a value. Economic rights are, 
but those tend to be about a floor of protection, not, as I mentioned, about the need for broader fairness and a ceiling on inequality. I would also uh, mention the value of peace, which is not really something at which human rights ideologically or practically have aimed. So I would um, restate Bernard's objection to Obama's lawyers in a slightly different way because it seems to me they actually did care about torture and not punishing it, but proscribing it, uh, and entrench uh, 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 public and legal norms about torture about as, as well as they could in their political circumstance. Uh, and it will be very hard for Trump to undo uh, that entrenchment, although we can fear he might. Mm -hmm. However, Obama's lawyers did undo a lot of constraints on war making. Uh, and that, uh, those are not ones that human rights address, except in their consequences. Uh, and this is something we can legitimately fear the new president uh, can use uh, to expand the war on terror even further, make it even more uh, brutal. Uh, and uh, it's not clear to me that human rights ideologically or especially practically are up to the challenge of our continuing age of endless war and may have helped enable it thanks to the kinds of interpretations that Bernard mentioned. Can I just one tiny footnote? Yeah. I should, I mean, so I think the discussion is being constructed into some opposition which I'm not totally comfortable with, in part because um, I, I love human rights. I'm all, I'm all for it. Give me human rights. I mean, give, me, give, me, give me, you know, I, please. I need them in my cases. It's great. I'm all for it. I'm not in any way, you know, opposed to human rights. So I don't want that construction. I usually never navigate in these waters, actually. Um, this is, my work is, is in very different contexts, usually punishment practices and critical theory, but not human rights. But I'm, you know, I love human rights. <laughs> and my, on my clients and, my, and everybody that I represent loves human rights. Okay. okay. Um, so I think what we'll do now is to open to the floor. And I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, um, I'll take three questions and then give the panel opportunity to answer whatever they want. So Homi, Carrie, and the gentleman there with the, with the, with the check shot, and then we'll move to the other Thank side of the room. Much. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the real problem with any political or social set of ideas or instruments is, that, is to, if it becomes too lovable. <laughs> so I roundly reprimand you for loving. <laughs> That's the, you know, not being lovable. I think there is an issue here which goes back to a very old mode of articulation of the ethics of human rights, which is the question of aspiration. They're aspirational. Now, what weight you give to aspirationality is, I think, an issue. Aspiration is not that they're all achievable, but they're aspirational. They're, they're, as, as Jackie said, you, you could mobilize around them. So I think that's one issue that I'd be interested to hear. And I think there are very different views of what the uses and abuses of aspiration might be. My question to, <clears throat> to Bernard is that as I understand it, <clears throat> your interests are in the ethics of critique. It's not just in critique, it's, it's not in the hermeneutics. It's, it's the hermeneutics, but it's all the ethics of critique. And for you, my question is, why should a politically engaged ethics of critique necessarily have to, have to point towards a utopia, unless you take the aspirational thing? I mean, why should that be utopic? I mean, I'm here completely with Walter Benjamin. I think utopians, uh, utopians and utopias are the, are the problem. So I'm absolutely, I'll stand on that side. Okay. My question to Sam is whether the struggle for rights is agonistic to socialism or whether it is possible to bring the two in some way into a close conversation. And to Catherine, thank you for the genealogy of the, you know, the form formulators of rights from the global south. I don't, I know very little about Latin America, but in India, 
and you know you talked about Madam Pandit and the Nehruvian ideology and so on and so forth. Here I'm afraid to say that the role played by rights in the national struggle was, was actually deeply problematic, precisely in Sam's terms, in terms of both redistributive justice and inequality. Because remember that Ambedkar, the leader of the Dalits, was, had to separate himself after having been the chair of the Constitutional Committee and produced a minoritarian constitution, the untouchables were, were served extraordinarily badly by the nationalist movement, which is why you have the Dalit movement today as it is. So it, the rights of the untouchables were untouched. Okay. Social distribution was actually, and economic inequality was not dealt with. So if you wouldn't mind just marking those questions, we'll, we'll thank you. Okay, Car Carrie. Would you maybe, maybe I mean, everybody knows Homie since he introduced himself, but maybe just introduce yourself briefly, Carrie. Oh, sure. Um, Carrie Elkins from the History Department. <clears throat> and my, first of all, thank you to Jackie and to all the panelists. Um, and I think uh, I just have sort of general comment, and I suppose the question and comment can be directed to all of you as, as uh, I've listened to sort of the back and forth. But I, I suppose my question or, or general comment first goes to you, Bernard, and that is um, I really have to say I profoundly disagree with your presentist uh, frame of, of human rights. And certainly um, I can say as an historian who studies torture in empires and torture more generally, it, the clock doesn't start with Obama's administration um, by any stretch of the imagination. Surely you're aware of Torture and Democracy, Rajali's very important book, um, as well as other work that's going on right now that is looking at the intersection between torture and violence and liberalism and empire, um, which, which then I suppose the question to, to you would be what happens if in fact your clock starts much, much earlier? And the broader, I think, question too, and, and it sort of touches on something that you um, raised, Sam, at the very end, and that was because at first, I was going to ask you something else when you said human rights as a spiritual orientation, but then you were talking about human rights as a subset of ideals. And I suppose my question is, to what degree are we really talking about critiques of liberalism of which human rights is one part of it? Because as you're bouncing around, you've been talking about human rights, but you've been talking about a whole range of things that don't necessarily always fall under that umbrella. And what happens when we think about liberalism as being born, as we know, is the same time as imperialism, where inherent in that birth in the mid-19th century is an abject denial of citizenship and rights to brown and black people, which, of course, responds, I think, very clearly to your point made that people are asking for sovereignty and human rights, because rights did not come a priori with sovereignty in a particular kind of liberalism. And so when we think about it in that way, I think we're talking about a moment, my own view on this would be a moment in the Trump administration, yes, this waxes and wanes, and sometimes it is very in the open, these contradictions in the liberal project, but other times it's less so. And so, uh, you know, the idea that we have to find a new utopia when in fact, if we put this in the longer durée, I think we have to ask ourselves, I, I knew I'd get that in, Jackie. Mm -hmm. um, should we be asking ourselves different questions? Thank you very much. Yeah, gentlemen at the back. Uh, Jimmy Xu from Harvard Yanjing Institute. Um, so, my, um, so my first question. Um, my impression is that uh, Professor Harcourt uh, starts from your the area you're working pretty much in uh, punishment and torture, and uh, these uh, things tend to you know uh, offend deeply into a sense of justice. So you tend to uh, picture human rights as more you want it to be natural, very powerful and uncompromising, whereas um, Professor Moyne t uh, tends to think about this whole thing through economic social rights, you know, distributed uh, di uh, distribu justice, and so, so uh, Sam has a pretty different picture, and Sam is more sensitive to uh, the, the, the in probably insensitiveness of rights as a weapon or as an instrument of democratic governance. Because when you talk about governance, it has to do with balancing. It has to do with you know promoting certain kind of com uh, common good. Whereas rights is something that's whether you have it or you don't have it, whether you're violated or you're not violated, and it's very uh, easy. Just uh, it connects to courts. 
you know, up to co the courts decide, not up to politics to decide. So the question? Yes. So pretty much a comment or a question. So, so first question is, um, uh, besides the, uh, the division between political civil rights or uh, social economic rights, are there just these different species that are grouped together under the banner of human rights? Uh, are there more, more specific and more uh, you know, subtle ways of grouping them you know, into subgroups and develop different strategies of, of coping with uh, these goods? Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, uh, a lot of uh, material on the table. So, who'd like to start? Yeah, Catherine, please. Uh, I'd like to uh, respond to Homi's uh, interesting comment and question. And so, I'm not saying that just because some government announces rights that they're t uh, it's exactly your point between aspirations and the actual enjoyment of rights. So, rights are not just aspirations, they're struggles. And governments uh, routinely say they believe in rights and then deny them to people. And so, but what's interesting is that rights, because once they're put into constitutions or into declarations, provide tools for mobilization that can bring about change. And the Indian example is a great one in terms of the, the right to food being put in the Indian constitution. And then we have uh, very important Supreme Court decisions saying that, that you know, the government's going to do something to live up to that right to food. Um, and it also, I think, makes, you know, turns to the issue of, you know, can human rights deal with some of these socioeconomic issues? Um, a, you know, a judge in India, I mean, a Supreme Court in India has ordered a, a massive uh, a, a program to feed children around the country. Now, you'd say that's just a, uh, that's just a floor, that's an insignificant floor that we shouldn't be concerned about. It's a really important floor. Um, and so, okay. uh, so I'm saying, that, that, so to struggle, Human rights takes time. It emerges through struggle. It's, governments don't hand it to people on silver platters, regardless of what they say in the United Nations. Okay. I'm 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 actually going to use my prerogative as the moderator here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Sam, did you want to say something next? I'll just briefly connect an answer to both of the, the questions. You know, I, I think um, there's no reason seemingly in principle why um, what you might call a, a liberal project around rights, including socioeconomic rights, can't fit with a, a broader egalitarian agenda, why we can't have a floor um, and have a ceiling and therefore a whole room. Um, of social justice as well. Um, but it's nonetheless the case that the chart, you know, which are, you know, Catherine's always demanding empirical information from me, and I finally <laughs> give some, and, and it's trivialized. But the chart <laughs> was so important um, as this recent era of the prestige of human rights have been the age of inequality. And so then we have to ask, what is the significance of this fact? Does it mean that what's true in principle isn't true in practice? Now, I'm neutral. We know what a liberal would say. We know what a Marxist would say. I would say that we haven't yet explored the, you know, the, the full potential of liberalism and thus what its, what its real limitations are. And it's because um, we've allowed a certain set of norms and a certain international project to become so prestigious that we lost track uh, of, of a, a broader project. And I would cite as evidence of, of that fact the agenda of the Democratic Party uh, and its grievous reversal a few days ago. Thank you. Yeah, Bernard. So uh, those, uh, I, I want to address the aspirational and the historical questions. On the aspirational, actually, that made me think that as I was listening to my own ethic of critique of um, Sam Moyne, that actually, the genealogy that brings human rights back in the fold of ideology, uh, which is what you did, essentially, um, might uh, answer that question because uh, what it suggests, of course, is that human rights were aspirational in the form of an ideology, replacing socialist, communist, and other forms of ideologies. And it's possible then that actually uh, what it would lead to, 
as it gets relatively vacated or not, um, would be to other forms of aspirational ideologies, right? Um, now, do they need to be utopian? Um, surely not. Um, that does, and, but, but, I, but I did want to emphasize that the, I, I was just noticing in relationship to Sam Moyne's book that the objects of, my objects of critique have been things like order maintenance policing, profiling, the free market in various different exercises of producing genealogies, and the kind of the denaturalization of those concepts would leave a state of, em of emptiness that I would find acceptable, right? Uh, in, a, in a different way than I think the, uh, the denaturalization of human rights does because I still need something in that context to uh, represent my, my clients when I'm doing practical work. On the historical front, I would say, yes, no, I, I, Yes or no? <laughs> or I, I, I was sounding presentist, but I just finished teaching an intense seminar all year on, on torture that was called From the Inquisition to Guantanamo, and that took us all the way back to antiquity and, and, and torture as a method of interrogation and antiquity of slaves through the Inquisition, etc. I think it's necessary, of course, to place um, our current situation in a historical context, not only to understand it better, but also to find sources of uh, resistance uh, in history. And so, um, and in that sense, uh, I find the greatest inspiration from uh, William of Ockham, uh, who uh, himself was accused of heresy and uh, went to uh, uh, face his charges uh, in Avignon at the papacy. And what he said, and of course he then got into another fight uh, over uh, the Franciscan uh, issues of property and had to leave. Uh, and, and, uh, and what he said ultimately was that subjects must be warned and guarded against being subjected more than necessary. Uh, and it's that idea of resistance, I think, that has pervaded history um, and that offers for us a lot of places to go to, uh, to find ways to think about uh, torture today and, and how to resist it. Okay, we're just going to take a final round of questions, Sarah, if that's okay, and then we'll end. So, um, one, two, and three. Okay, so, uh, yeah, one here. Yeah. I actually was calling on you. I'm Steve Livingston. See. I'm at the Car Center. Um, and also at George Washington University. This question is for Professor Harcourt. First of all, I commend you for your work. Um, I, it's, it's magnificent that you're doing that. You said earlier, just a little while ago, though, that you love human rights, uh, but you don't find a lot of utility in it in your work. Um, I wonder if you would comment on the uh, fact that it's, as best as we can tell anyway, that it's actually a human rights principle in transnational human rights advocacy that's led in part to a fairly steep decline in the total number of, of executions in the United States. It dipped below in 2013 to 39. And uh, last year, I believe it was under 20, if I'm not mistaken. And this is in part because of the difficulty in getting the drugs that are necessary to kill somebody. Um, so isn't it in indeed the case that international, transnational human rights advocacy is one of your best friends in the courtroom? Thank you. Yeah. Michael. For those who appreciate and draw upon human rights discourse, there is an embarrassing coincidence, which is that the heyday of human rights discourse, roughly the last four decades, coincides with the heyday of neoliberal globalization. So the question is whether this is merely an embarrassing coincidence or whether it reflects an ideological affinity between the two. On the face of it, uh, th there might be some grounds for thinking there is an affinity for at least two reasons. First, 
both emphasize the uh, necessity to transcend national borders and to emphasize identities, cosmopolitan or global, that underwrite the project of human rights discourse and the free movement of capital and trade across boundaries. So there's the transcendence uh, of national borders, number one, and number two, um, connected to that, a tendency to abstract in the justification for the human rights on the one hand or global capitalism on the other, to abstract from a more particular, situated, rooted uh, uh, national or spiritual conceptions of the common good. So my question is, uh, do you see this merely as a coincidence or do you think there is something to the ideological affinity? Thank you very much. Yes, last question over there, gentleman, the blue shirt, yeah. Mm -hmm. In addition to the, uh, uh, the difficulty in obtaining drugs um, and the, the cause of that being uh, human rights sensibilities in European countries and elsewhere, I wondered if um, human rights also didn't play in another way in the larger uh, movement against uh, the death penalty, and that would be that you know, the United States, of course, is now rare among mature democracies of even having the death penalty. And many states have been trending towards either, either uh, abolishing or at least imposing a moratorium on the death penalty. Um, and, and much of this is attributed to, um, to human rights sensibilities um, abroad and domestically. And so I wondered if, it, if the larger pitch, picture beyond specific cases that you might be litigating um, isn't one of, um, of more triumphalism uh, in victory of, of human rights. Thank you very much. So we'll, we'll have a very quick, uh, just brief responses from each of you, and we'll end that way. So, um, Catherine, do you want to start? And then we'll have Sam, and then we'll end with Bernard. Yes, on this point about uh, neoliberalism. One is the, the um, connection only makes sense if you take Sam, uh, Sam's notion that human rights emerges in the 70s, and I actually uh, um, completely disagree with that. Human rights begins to emerge in the 40s, and so human rights corresponds and coexists with the period the, of uh, the growth of the welfare state, uh, not necessarily with neoliberalism. So secondly, I've worked a lot on human rights in Latin America, and where it coincided, it coincided exactly because repressive neoliberal regimes in Latin America were torturing their opponents who were using human rights to try to defend themselves. So they were contrary, not co complicit kinds of things. Human rights was the main tool against repressive neoliberal regimes. And I just, that people keep trotting out this coincidence. There's, as far as I can tell, there's no <laughs> research to show any uh, connection, and there's a lot of historical evidence that, uh, that human rights movements have uh, been very active against neoliberal policies that, that harm people. Thank you. Yeah, Sam. You know, Professor Sandel has put his finger on the crucial issue because, of course, uh, in spite of the fact that some advocated human rights in the 40s, the real project of significance was the nationalist welfare state, which not only did have a kind of na nationalist collectivist character, but also did not really um, traffic much in n normatively individualist conceptions. Um, uh, even in the, the, the capitalist welfare states, you, you find much more rhetoric of class reconciliation, um, and, and, and for that matter, patriotism and the common good. And of course, that's when the Great Compression was. So your question is, is contrary to what was just said, a burning one. Um, I would, I, a, a, as someone who's still interested in exploring the, 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 the possibilities of liberal um, ideas, I don't want to prematurely um, take this coincidence to be one that um, it is, it, it is um, you know, fatal to the idea of human rights because it would be strange to argue that human rights activists have abetted neoliberalism uh, neoliberals have abetted neoliberalism. Um, and while I think I disagree with Catherine about how much difference they've made, they surely haven't um, um, hurt people. Um, however, I do think it's important to get a, at an ecological conception of the relationship, by, me, by, me, by which I mean 
thinking how do they get along and, and, and coexist and prosper in the same era? And I have a very simple answer. They work on different things. Human rights tries to construct a floor of protection in the socioeconomic domain, and neoliberalism tries to obliterate the ceiling on inequality, and both have coexisted as big projects in our time, uh, and neither interferes with the other. Thank you. Yeah, Bernard. So very word. quickly, um, two issues. Uh, first, um, again, I think it's really important to take a um, state by state look at these questions um, in the death penalty context. And you know, the fact that the European Union uh, requires uh, abolition as a condition of uh, belonging and that that was tied in part to human rights um, uh, language is is very promising in the United States. And although you know, although if you look on an individual basis, when Mitterrand eliminated uh, the death penalty in France in 1981, it was not a human rights discourse at all. It was his personal opposition. He told the people, uh, he told the population in France when he was running that he would abolish the death penalty because he thought it was uh, morally uh, unconscionable, and uh, and he did. Uh, once he was elected. In the United States, the reductions in executions have been uh, dramatic and consistent as a result of waves of different um, uh, litigation uh, involving mental retardation, involving juveniles, involving lethal injection, which began not as a result of uh, lack of supply of drugs, but as a result of botched uh, lethal executions that then raise questions about whether or not um, people were actually unconscious and not feeling uh, what was going on. The fact that uh, English companies and European companies have decided not to send uh, drugs has been uh, one element and a really important one. Um, but um, if, you're, if you're interested, if I may, there's a conference all day tomorrow on Carol Steiker and Jordan Steiker's new book called it Courting um, Death. Thank you. Courting death uh, at the law school, and so we will be discussing these issues of kind of the death penalty, where it stands. I, I and and all and all I'll say is that it was in a very good position until uh, last week. Um, now, uh, finally, on the question of neoliberalism, I think that's really important because uh, there's, I believe, there is a there is an there is an inextricable link between. Uh, the rhetoric and ideology of neoliberalism and uh, increased uh, uses of state power in the area of punishment, that these have always historically, uh, since the 18th century, gone together, notions of laissez-faire in economic domains and state power and state policing in, on, the, on the criminal front. I think if, again, we look parochially at the United States, what we did see over the past 30, 40 years was an association of neoliberalism on the one hand, mass incarceration, forms of punishment that have exploded in a way that is entirely unprecedented in history, and that in that process, sadly, um, human rights uh, limitations have not had much impact on mass incarceration or the racial discrimination that takes place in the criminal justice system or the fact that there are today 79 million people with criminal records, 8 million people under supervision, et cetera, that um, from a parochial, again, US context, right? Um, it's, uh, it, well, that's, we, can, we okay. can talk about it tomorrow too. Okay, well thank you all very much for being here and thank you for organizing this.